Hey everyone, this is Tom Salemi of Device Talks. Welcome back to the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. We have a jam-packed episode for you today. We've got some breaking news. Of course, on Thursday night, which is last night as I'm recording this, uh, DaVinci announced it got FDA approval for DaVinci 5. So who did I call? Of course, I called Joe Mullings of the Mullings Group to uh, sit down with him and uh, and talk about the impact of DaVinci 5. So Chris Newmarker and I connected with Joe Mullings on his own turf. We uh, were visiting digitally over a Zoom call, of course, but uh, Joe is in the 160 Studios uh, studio and the Dragonfly studio team uh, was able to uh, fit us into their very tight schedule and record uh, some great insights from Joe as to what this means for DaVinci, what this means for other players and their surgical robotic system. So uh, lots of great thoughts there. A little later in the podcast, we'll hear from our keynote guest. He is Morali Srivatsa. He's the CEO of Acura Medical, and they are uh, working on next-generation thrombectomy devices. I had a chance to visit with Acura uh, with Kayleen Brown back in the fall, the day before October, I'm sorry, Device Talks West, and uh, just a, a special visit, uh, I referenced that in the interview, but it's just great to be at a place where uh, so much med tech is going on. So I really enjoyed reconnecting with Morali, hearing his story as to where he got or how he got where he is and uh, how Acura sees the future of thrombectomy. So I'm sure you'll enjoy that conversation. A uh, few notes. I wanted to uh, remind you that uh, we are talking surgical robotics next week on Device Talks Tuesdays. I'll give some more details in the middle of the episode, but we'll have presentations by Intuitive, by Medtronic, and by Virtual Incision. It's all free. Uh, you can ask questions during the presentations, and uh, it's really going to be a great opportunity for you to hear directly from these leaders in the space. Go to devicetalks.com to register. And of course, uh, make sure you register for Device Talks Boston, which is happening on May 1st and May 2nd at the Boston Convention Exhibition Center. Very excited to build off the DaVinci News. Uh, we actually have Brian Miller, who's Executive Vice President and Chief Digital Officer at Intuitive. And uh, he'll be on hand to talk about the uh, the power of DaVinci 5. So uh, we uh, were able to get him on as a keynote, hoping that uh, the FDA approval would come through, and it did. So uh, I'm really fired up about that presentation. So make sure you don't miss that. You can go to boston.devicetalks.com to register for that. And of course, devicetalks.com to register for next week's uh, Surgical Robotics Device Talks Tuesdays. And again, I'll give you a little more information about that later in the show. All right. With uh, all that being said, let's get this episode going. All right. You ready for this? Ready. Chris Newmark, how are you, sir? Doing well, Tom. Doing well. Good to talk to you from a beautiful more Friday morning here in Minneapolis. Yes, thank you for the uh, for the weather report. This is the time yeah. when uh, <laughs> we'll normally talk about our least favorite sausages or oh, our yeah. uh, creepy Hummel figurines, but we're not. We don't have time for don't silliness have time. today. No, we no. don't. There's too much news going on, and Serious we're time. here. We're visiting. We're actually a visiting team. We're at the uh, the lovely 160 Studios virtually. Uh, thank you to the 160 team for uh, fitting us into their busy busy schedule. For some late breaking news, we need a late breaking news flasher right. of some kind. So, uh, some, like ticker we're... machine sound like you're... that's right. Don't, 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 Welcome to your studio, our podcast. Yeah. So, uh, Tom, Chris, good to see you. And uh, like you said earlier, a special shout out to the Dragonfly team for uh, getting this. You and I were on the phone last night and uh, right out to Nicole Ager and the team. So let's let's jump into the late breaking news. Yes, right. let's do like, it. Heading over so, the wires last night, we had the, uh, the news that uh, Intuitive had uh, one FDA clearance of their next gen Da Vinci 5 robot. We actually had a quick scoop like two months ago about about them uh, seeking FDA clearance for it because I did something radical. I actually sat down and listened to the earnings call and was like, crazy. oh, you know, they're wow. Yeah. Crazy idea. Yeah. So the, this the, was the projection was going to be late April and it came, you know, early. And and mm -hmm. let's and, and Tom, I want to hear what you have to say, but let's just note this. 
that the FDA got this out in March. So let's just put a pin in that and keep talking. No, that's that's great. And, and we were anticipating it. We do have Brian Miller at uh, his EVP, the Chief Digital Officer at Device Talks Boston, precisely because we were anticipating the approval to come this spring. But there was part of me that was like, uh, oh, I hope this really happens. And the FDA did deliver. So we'll be talking a lot about surgical robotics at Device Talks Boston. Uh, we'll have distal motion, yeah. we'll have Medtronic, we'll have Quantum, we'll have Stryker. Uh, I'm doing a keynote with CMR. And now, of course, the aforementioned intuitive conversation. It's a big, big topic at Device Talks Boston. Next week, we also have our surgical robotics virtual week on Device Talks Tuesdays, which actually extends Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Uh, where we'll have presentations by Intuitive and Medtronic. And uh, Virtual Incision, which I know is a favorite company of yours, Joe, as well. So we've got r- surgical robotics on the mind. And then when the news came out, Chris and I were kind of banting back and forth of who can we get to talk about it. And of course, first and foremost, let's get Joe and Absolutely. see if he's available. So that stage being set, Chris, you're the professional journalist here. I'm just a, I'm just a, a, st- a studio guy. Uh, oh, don't say that, Tom. Come on. Take it, take it away. I mean, the, um, you know, we had FDA clearance of the, uh, of the, you know, the new robot and, you know, this kind of, this is like their, their next generation multi-port surgical robot there'd been you know a lot of you know speculation over the last year or two when they would get a next generation uh robot out and you know along with uh you know announcing the fda clearance uh, they they gave a nice summary of like all the different uh you know improvements that they've packaged into the da vinci 5 versus you know previous uh previous uh, systems um you know including uh you know they've got new well, actually, I'll start out with the thing that stuck out the most to me was that they said that the Da Vinci Five has ten thousand times more computing power than the uh, the, the Da Vinci Da Vinci Z, the uh, the previous generation. Which I mean, they're saying this just isn't for you know what the type of you know programs they could run on it now, but they've you know packaged in all this computing pro, you know power so that you know for for you know whatever you know developers you know figure out in the future that you could run on the system so they've really i mean that kind of signals to me they've really built this thing to you know to be something that you could run a lot of innovative software on for potentially you know for for years so i mean that that really stuck out to me and then you know there's all kinds of uh you know, I saw their uh, packaging and features to, uh, you know, a bunch of extra, you know, features to help with the, you know, the workflow flow in the OR, very important for health providers, you know, right now with, you know, all the the, the, the challenges they're going through with, uh, with efficiency. Um, I mean, got the list goes on and on. I mean, you know, um, you know, new surgeon controllers with these, you know, with a uh, vibration and uh, tremor controls to, you know, to get, have a smoother experience for the surgeon. Um Next gen, you know, 3D display and image processing. Uh, this uh, force feedback technology, uh, you know, to, you know, to to measure the 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 forces being exerted on you know tissue during surgery, and you know, a whole new data stream to to analyze because of this uh, force feedback, you know, technology. And uh, you know, it's and and also they uh, they they made the console more. Um, you know, more, they say that the new console is more comfortable for, uh, for the surgeons, which, you know, if you're a surgeon doing all these procedures for the day, you know, having a more comfortable console sounds like a, sounds like a good plan. So that's, that's no, in sounds, a nutshell. Yeah. Sounds like a complete package. And, uh, and, uh, I know one thing I've been seeing on social media and I know the messaging has sort of been that this has been 10 years in the making. So Joe, we'll turn to you. Uh, yeah. this seems like, I feel like Joe, Joe Biden after, uh, Obamacare passed, like this is, this, this is a big family show deal you know uh, uh <laughs> <laughs> what do you what was your takeaway Joe? what were you anticipating uh and uh what are your thoughts um well look i i think you know chris you pointed it out intuitive we just released the chassis for probably the next five to seven years in the past we could have said 10 years but i just think the cycle of innovation occurring right yeah. now is probably five to seven on a chassis like this so and then the changing centers of care, and we'll jump into that in a minute too. So not surprising any of these features. Most of these were sort of baked into the conversations happening. But what's more important, you inferred, what's, what else is under the skin, right? The, the, these, these features did not take, you know, 10 years to uh, reveal themselves. I, I, I think that this is, this is another, another intuitive of pulling people deeper into the pool. I, this is a time that Intuitive has done two things right now. They've created this technological moat 
around robotics that people think that, oh, it's a, it's a knockoff on DaVinci XI or it's, well, you, you're not going to have a knockoff on DaVinci 5 for a long time. So that's number one. Number two is Gary talked about or Intuitive talked about there's going to be a very, very limited release on this. So the reason they came out really fast on this is um, this is going to freeze any CapEx acquisition coming down range for any robot that's out there right now on that, hmm. on that larger format, higher acuity case robotic system. Because, and then you hear them use the word placements rather than sales. And these are all things you have to note. Because if you're just looking, this is at a robot instead of a surgery as a service, robotic assisted surgery as a service is really what Intuitive is pushing here. So they've built the robotic moat around the business. They've just mm -hmm. staked it earlier. It's going to freeze any, especially OUS, any um, high acuity surgical robotic platform. And then they're building the financial moat around the business where you don't have to buy the robot. You're going to lease it. We're going to partner with you. And then we're going to share the risk and the reward as you go ahead and no longer have to find 1.5 to 2 million to acquire something like this. And so now Gary's going to get, rather than putting, and he's got that war chest to be able to do this. And now he's just delivered to the surgeons a very meaningful platform. Again, very limited launch, but it's going to still freeze the market. I don't expect them really coming out in mass, probably till even Q1 of 2025, but he did what he wanted yeah. to do. He froze the market. And now everything's going to be compared to, and this is where Intuitive gets that 20 years of inertia where they continue to move the goalpost. Every other surgical robotic, large format surgical robotic platform on these high acuity cases had to put a flag in the ground and they had to put the flag on the ground trying to get close to Intuitive. And Intuitive just moved that flag and everybody else is frozen in place there as, as they go ahead now they're locked into their pathway to the FDA. So, so go ahead, you, Tom, question. Is the, is the, is the market, let's, let's, there's a lot to unpack there, yeah. a lot of great stuff. <clears throat> let's talk about on, uh, freezing the market, first of all. Is the market frozen for uh, a strategic that would have acquired a smaller surgical robotics company to to uh, complement their own surgical tools uh, portfolio? Or is the market also frozen for larger companies that are developing their own systems? And, and maybe you could unpack a bit what, what um, frozen means. I mean, because these yeah. companies just aren't going to stop. Yeah. Frozen means is, so let's look at Hugo as an example, and even Otava yeah. as an example, right? Let's look at those two right now. The, both both J and J and Medtronic had to get into the robotic assisted business because they were having erosion to their current market because of Intuitive, and this is gonna this is gonna really hurt more because now the feature set, the surgical end effectors, the tools, the ancillary, the devices that go with this, the digital capabilities, the the data that the hospital and or outpatient surgery centers are going to now be able to get will far surpass what was in Otava and Hugo highly likely. So that's one. And now you're eating into an 80% gross margin on their analog endosurgery business. And now you're moving them even, Intuitive's pulling them deeper into the pool of razor thin margins if Hugo really does get market acceptance, if Otava does get through the FDA in 2005, I might even say 2006. And so yeah. they had to freeze their systems against the standard of the XI. Mm -hmm. And now Gary's just moved the goalpost way down range. And so you don't have that subject matter expertise in J&J &J or Medtronic. You're not a digital native. And now you're going to be comparing Hugo and Otava to what they could only imagine XI was in. So that's what I mean by moving the goalposts mm -hmm. and their designs and pathway to the FDA had to be frozen. I can guarantee you it didn't include any of these feature sets that now DaVinci 5 has out. I mean, have they, have they basically just already won the game then? No. No, the game's not over, right? We're paying an infinite game with robotic-assisted surgery. But what I think you did is you now accelerated the lower acuity, not less complicated, but I think you just accelerated 
the um, the value of the distal motions in the moon surgicals because they are going to be directed at that middle market, middle acuity, and to compete against intuitive as a core against the high acuity cases is just, they've again, they're pulling you deeper into the pool on the financing moat as well as the technological moat and the form factor moat. And so now, why pick a fight in that area, which is where Hugo, I believe, and Otava are trying to pick it? Now you got to drop down to the middle acuity cases as an entry point. So I think this is good for surgical robotics overall, mm -hmm. and it now will accelerate yeah. people saying, okay, form factor, acuity, that's where we have to fight. Now, if you think intuitive doesn't have four solutions sitting on the sidelines for the middle acuity cases as a gen five light you're crazy but i think that intuitive is going to wait for two years three years until the ambulatory surgical centers declare what does that financial model look like because there's no reason to fight there right now and then as soon as intuitive sees where that market's declaring itself because it's still early i think they're going to come out with a, a middle acuity platform that those surgeons are already accustomed to but uh, the the first movers that will get through fda or through fda on that middle acuity in asc will have a different fight on their hand but by then they'll have been acquired by highly likely medtronic j and j or dare i say striker mm -hmm. because you're going to need the money yeah. to fight in that space so i think da vinci 5 is a blessing for the lower acuity, mid to large format robots. That's where I'm holding my position right now. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't want to yeah. uh, suggest that a Medtronic or a J, I mean, they, they're not small companies, they've got financial force. And, and I, I hear exactly what you're saying about, uh, about Da Vinci 5 and the, the problems it creates. Um, but I have to think that it's hard to me envision, I mean, it's hard to me for, for me to envision kind of a, a single standard of surgical robotic system being adopted across healthcare, there's going to have to be room for, yes, the distal motions and the moons, but also for other larger comprehensive surgical systems, do you think? Yeah, but they're always going to be compared against the platinum standard. You you can't yeah. make a you can't make a, a robot cheaper than Da Vinci 5. It's not possible, okay. right? You can't do that. Then when you think about the Chinese robots, you're going to have IP issues plus the geopolitical issues pulling those into the U.S. So I'm talking about the U.S. market right now. Hmm. Yeah, right? yeah, we'll focus on that. Right, let's focus on the U.S. Yeah. market. So, so let's look at the U.S. market at large. Any of these other large formats, CMR is going to come in. CMR, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is right now, I think, in the FDA. Um, mm -hmm. And so yeah. CMR, solid robot. But again, the price is not going to be much different. And then you've got a war chest of billions of dollars that, you know, I think about intuitive just starving people after they bring in all their troops, all their supplies, set up their, their camp and commit everything. And then intuitive is going to go, oh, okay. And now I'm going to move it this way with my financial moat, or I'm going to move mm -hmm. it with my technological moat. I would not want to be in a fight and you're not going to accelerate 20 years of expertise in order to catch up to an intuitive. So I'm not saying that large format, high acuity, robotic platform, form factor, and business model isn't up for grabs, but it's not up for grabs in the next decade. Right, Wow. That's right. And, and the business model aspect, the financial, the, 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 the um, robotic surgery as a, as, a, as a subscription or a service sort of model, whatever you want to call it, um, that obviously opens the doors for other providers to be able to afford it, but it also changes the financial. And I think we've talked about this before the financial parameters for Medtronic and J and J as they're moving into the space, they can't now budget. Well, if we spend this, we'll make that because the, that is suddenly a lot less clear than it was prior. Is that where we're sort of headed? That we're just going to get, it's going to sort of mystify the whole financial model of surgical robotics. Well, it really impacts the startups, right? So if you look at the startup companies, so this is where the build to buy model and the venture companies and private equity companies that have constructed their sort of thesis around a build to buy model, this accelerates the build to buy model in surgical robotics. Why? Because the original thesis in surgical robotics, if you look at a vicarious, so you look at uh, a CMR, uh, was 
was build a robot, sell a robot, put 1.5 million into the coffers, we can at least finance the company. But now, if the lease model is the current standard of business, that financing requires the company to have to carry that, the startup company, to have to carry that financial burden, where in the past, it was not built like that. So what does that mean? That means that the J&Js and the Medtronics and the Strikers, dare I say, um, will, on soft tissue robotics, will mm. have the financial wherewithal. But, but their R&D budgets are smaller than ever. And so any acquisition generally comes off the R&D balance sheet. So if you're going to go out and buy a surgical robotic platform that's already generating revenue, you need a few things to happen. You need that surgical, that large format soft tissue surgical robotic platform to have the billion dollars required even before you're required, even before you're acquired, you need that in place. And then you need to develop a robot that at least is infringing upon where Intuitive's going and, 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 and convince people to buy that. And so that, those two, that model will not exist in the large format up against Intuitive, but the build to buy will. So you mm -hmm. will get the, the digital native surgical robotic startup company that will be financed by the off balance sheet of a J and J or a Medtronic or a striker. They will then share the clinical lift that's required through the large player. And then they'll be able to, the large player will then be able to construct their go to market team, their, their, their support team in that large format to be able to take that to market. So the acquisition price will be lower. The risk will be mitigated out. The robot that's being built will be built by robotic experts. And then the financial model no longer is a moat by intuitive. But all those dynamics are going to have another three or four years ahead of them in large format, high acuity robotics. That's why I come back to some of these middle market acuity companies like Moon and Distal mm -hmm. that are addressing the market in the ASC. And then Gary will come in or, you know, <laughs> they will come in and they will introduce, unleash their hounds their sales team, marketing team, <laughs> data team, <laughs> reputation into the ASC market. But by then, there'll probably be two or three acquisitions in that middle acuity surgical robotic platform, in my opinion. It sounds like there's at least a few years window when the, those companies can, can get in and try to do something. But there's no rush for Intuitive to get into that right now. Right now, with the release of five, and until you start to have some of these de novo ASCs being built out of the ground, where that's an entire market that, that Intuitive's not in right now, right? So you have to skate to where Intuitive is not in robotic-assisted surgery in their form factor, and that is mm -hmm. exclusively the ASCs. If you're going to market as your primary market into the hospital setting, you're going to, without exception, you're going to get suffocated over time. We, we, what about the surgical? I've got so many questions. First question, um, intuitive kind of let this link leak out in January that this was, may have, it was something the analysts kind of picked up on rumors. This obviously had to be a, a project that's been going on for a long time. Was it widely known that there was a five coming out? I, I've talked to intuitive people, interview. I've never said, hey, when's, when's five coming out? I should have asked that question, I suppose. They would, probably wouldn't have answered. But is this something that you have, have seen being in the works for a long time? Or has intuitive sort of been really successful at keeping this on the down low? Um, I think at any point in time, Tom, that intuitive has a number of programs going on. The same way that, yeah. the same way that even Oris and uh, uh, Verb had their internal bake-off. Um, on their two robots to see, you know, what was best uh, uh, in class. And then they, they, they've been listening to the market really well. When you didn't have a threat in the market um, at all on a form factor, that as a large uh, uh, format form factor, you know, you're listening to the market. What have what the docs been saying? Every, every SRS you went to that Vip Patel runs and his team is you can give me an intuitive robot, but I'll take 80% of what intuitive could do, but give me a better, better visualization system and let me see what I can't see. So, mm -hmm. you know, that has always been in, in development. You know, the weakness in any large format robot has always been the visualization system. 
until as of late, uh, the the workflow uh, and the console, uh, they haven't had to worry about that too much. I think you're seeing the current console release on five um, to be probably a precursor to an open cockpit um, that I think you're going to have to see in an ASC model. So it, it sort of is their hybrid move into it. Um, mm -hmm. Although surgeons still love the fidelity factor of having their head immersed in there. Uh, and uh, probably reduce that console by 30% on the weight side, which is a big issue. Uh, and the form factor probably shrunk down a bit. So um, I think this has been going on. I think at any point in time, you've got a half a dozen legitimate programs going on with Intuitive that are answering what they're listening to through, what do they have? 14 million cases in all their portfolio. And they've got an installed base of, 8,000, 8,500 robots, you're getting a lot of data back. Yeah, it's hard to compete with that. Final yeah. question, because I, I know you get a full day. Chris, do you have one or? or? No, nope, no, keep on yeah. going, Tom. <laughs> you're you're uh, on a so roll. Where does this, where does this, play? this is the kind of where this play out sort of question, but I had an interesting conversation with uh, a, a, or a LinkedIn post about BD and about their change in, in the lead of surgical. For those companies out there that have the surgical tools, but don't yet have a surgical robotics system, what is this? What is this signal to them? Do they just? I mean, it would. It had seemed previously. It seemed like well, they might buy a CMR. Or they might buy a system to kind of to kind of get into the game more quickly. If that freezing is happening, what happens with surgical robotic surgical supply surgical device companies that don't have a robotic system yet? How do you see sort of that unfolding over the next couple of years? Do they just sit and wait? Um, does it? Is, or is this a starter pistol telling them that they have to? Act now. What, what, how does that area of, of med tech unfold or, or unpack? I, I, I think if you don't have a surgical robot today on a soft tissue side, so let's just that's the conversation. Say yep. soft tissue side yep. and form factor. So let's talk about a large form factor on the soft tissue side. I think it accelerates. If your Medtronic J and J Striker, I'll even say BD. I'm really surprised Beckton Dickinson on the soft tissue side's not getting yet. They might, but. Let's say J and J, Medtronic, uh, and 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 Stryker. I think you have to get into the surgical robotic world, but you've got to do it in a lower to mid acuity case. Hopefully, mm -hmm. their egos will not get in the way that they need to be operating at that elite and get into a fight. Right? You don't bring a knife to a gunfight, and if you're <laughs> going to get in a fight with Intuitive, they're all bringing a knife to a gunfight, and you're just going to get destroyed. So I think this accelerates J&J, &J, Medtronic, and Stryker of getting into that middle acuity case into the ASC world. This is so good for robotic-assisted surgery at large because it's now going to allow R&D dollars to be poured into something that will actually get to the market in soft tissue robotics. And there are a couple platforms out there right now that are primed to be able to be solid entrance into that model, Tom. So I, I think this is fabulous for it's a great message that can be more competition from us that it's not well, going to be not a competition, competition squelcher. no it, it 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 should set the stage for what you shouldn't fight in and 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 if you go ahead and go large format against them right now your shareholders right. should probably come with torches and stakes <laughs> and so you need to be able to go into the market you can win it so that's that's what i think it does that's my takeaway on this one i think it's fabulous um, for the market at large. And I think it's fabulous for, again, the middle acuity, large format, mid format robotic surgical platforms that are going into the areas that Da Vinci is not right now. All right, great. Well, we, we clearly came to the right place for, uh, for insights and understanding. So Joe Mullings, thanks for uh, joining us on, uh, on the podcast. It's fantastic. Thanks so much. Thanks gentlemen. Have a good one. Hey, Chris, before we go, show me that uh, Prince cup again. <laughs> yeah, doing some doing some Minneapolis representing here. Love so, it. There you go. <laughs> That's right. See you guys. Take care, everyone. All right. See you. Take care. All right. Well, thanks again to Joe Mullings and the Dragonfly Studios team for fitting us in on a busy Friday morning. Next, I'd like to uh, tell you about our Device Talks Tuesdays Surgical Robotics Week. This is the first time we're doing this. Typically, our Device Talks Tuesdays are uh, on Tuesdays. Think, imagine that. Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, we'd have our presentations brought to you by our sponsors. We're doing things a bit differently this time around. We're going to have presentations by uh, major companies 
in the surgical robotic space. That includes intuitive, that includes Medtronic, that includes virtual incision. So if you go to devicetalks.com and look under the Device Talks Tuesdays tab, there's a registration button. Click on that. You can see all of the details. Uh, we will have uh, Catherine Rieger. She is Senior Director of Human Factors and User Research. She'll be talking about uh, DaVinci, F- DaVinci overall, but a little bit about DaVinci 5, but really how intuitive uh, understands and recognizes that the surgeon, humans, are, remain the most important part of a surgical robotic system. So she'll be talking about interfaces and how intuitive is, uh, is viewing that. So that's on Tuesday noon Eastern. And on the next day, Wednesday, March 20th at noon Eastern, I'll be speaking with Nikolai Begg. Nikolai Begg is Senior Director of Portfolio R&D. He is at the Robotic Surgical Technologies Group at Medtronic. And the title of Nikolai's talk is Insights to Innovation, the Future of Surgery. And uh, Nikolai will be talking about the intersection of people and technology what it means today, what it means for the future. So a really, really forward-looking discussion as to the future of technology and surgical robotics. And then on Thursday at noon Eastern, I'll be speaking with uh, the team at Virtual Incision. I'll be talking to Shane Farator, who's co-founder and chief technology officer, and Piet Hanul, who's uh, the chief medical officer, Dr. Piet Hanul. And uh, we're actually going to be taking a glimpse inside Virtual Incision's uh, mock OR, and they're going to be showing off their mirror system. The mirror system is a version of the system, the space mirror system, that went to the ISS. So uh, we've got three great conversations happening. Attendance to all three are free. You just need to register at devicetalks.com. If you watch live, we'll take questions. We'll answer. Get I'll get as many uh, as I can answered for you. I'll be the moderator of all three. And uh, if you can, you can also watch on demand. Uh, you won't be able to ask the questions, but you'll still be able to enjoy every other aspect. You'll hear, uh, you'll see presentations, you'll obviously uh, watch the presenters, and uh, it's it's almost as good as being live. But uh, I recommend being live. It'd be nice to connect with you. This uh, this the series is sponsored by uh, several great partners of uh, of Device Talks, including New England Wire Technologies, Aptics, Viant, Maxon, Wind River. Omniseal Solutions, Tegra Medical, and Bay Cable Custom Interconnect. So uh, thank you to all of our sponsors for making these three sessions possible and for making them free to you. So uh, go to devicetalks.com to register and uh, make sure you take part of this uh, very informative three days of surgical robotics talk. All right, now let us get into our conversation with Morali Sravasa. Again, he's the CEO of Acura Medical. Well, Morali Srivasa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Great to be here. Great to uh, visit again with, with Chief Ahmed. We actually had an in-person visit with you back in October before Device October Talks West. October 17, episode. yeah. Yeah, that was a real treat. Real treat. You gave us a nice show showing off your device and what it could do. And it was uh, really, really an impressive visit. You know, Kayleen Brown and I were energized by that for a couple of months after. So uh, thank you very much for your hospitality. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I love participating a couple of days later at the Device Talks West. Uh, again, my first time at Device Talks West, I thought it was very well organized, great thought leaders on the program. And also fairly intimate, which is always a challenge in in cardiovascular industry, right? I mean, the average conference has thousands, if not tens of thousands of people. To have a more intimate setting where you can ask questions, you can interact with the KOLs or the keynote speakers, I thought was really uh, impressive. And I look forward to Device Talks West again. Great. No, oh, thank you for that. Yeah, we had 600 plus there, but we have a lot going on. So the rooms themselves certainly felt cozy and approachable. So I, I'm glad that uh, registered with you. All right. Well, enough about me. Let's People have come to hear about you. We'll talk about Accor in a few minutes, but first let's find out how you got there. What was your uh, your first entry into the medical device industry? After about 10 years of working in various companies in the automotive and in the music sectors, I got my MBA in 1998 from IMD in Switzerland. There, I learned a lot about the medical technology industry. So one heard about the multi-link stent, which uh, had just been launched, I believe, in the late 90s. 
and had made a rapid progress. Uh, one learned about Medtronic and Earl Barkin's invention of the pacemaker, Michelle Murawski and the ICD. And when companies like Medtronic and Guidon came to campus, I was really intrigued by what they did and how they were able to transform the lives of both patients and those that treated those patients. And so I thought to myself, you know, I am interested in technology, but this way I can also have an impact on patients and do something useful to for society. And uh, that's kind of my entry point into med tech. Guidon back then was coming on campus and they had a really interesting system whereby they started you off in the field, especially those that did not have a prior medical technology background. They started you off in the field, taught you the business, and then moved you to marketing and to other roles. So that program really uh, got my attention. So I joined Guidant in Philadelphia as a field clinical rep back in 1999. Wow. And then moved to St. Paul and further on. So that was my introduction and entry into the medical technology industry. I'll lose my podcast license if I don't follow up. Did you say you were in the music industry prior to this? Yes. So I can <laughs> say that uh, I worked for CBS Records in India in from 91 to 94. I can honestly say that uh, people like Michael Jackson, Bruce Springsteen, uh, Maria Carey and others helped pay my salary, although they have no clue who I am. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they helped pay my salary back in those days. Wow. So was that a, a career you would sort of just, were you interested in a career in music or, or was it just a job that kind more, of led more to from a, another job? You know, from a commercialization perspective. Uh, yeah. Interesting. You know, All right. Marketing. I've heard automotive before, but yours might be the first reference to the music industry. Was there anything particular about, I mean, people often have stories, personal stories that kind of drew them to being interested in medical technology. And the time when you joined in the late 90s, I think that was a particularly exciting time where a lot of things really started to come online. And it's when I joined, started covering the med tech industry as well. But was there anything uh, in particular on a personal note that caught your heartstrings or caught your eye and drew you into med tech? Yeah, absolutely. So my grandfather, he had a bypass surgery in the early 80s, and he passed away in 98. And one could oh, wow, see okay. the impact in, of medicine on my grandfather in this case. And knowing that in 98, I was not an expert back then, but knowing that he, he might have had a much simpler surgery and, and same outcome with, say, the multi-link stent or other stents, kind of got me interested into looking more into this. Uh, We've had uh, family members that had received pacemakers. Pacemakers were just entering the Indian market where a lot of my family was at that time. And you could see the impact that these devices were having on patients and in people that I know uh, or, or closely related to me. And that made it even more compelling to be part of such an exciting industry that literally extends life and improves lives. Interesting. So are you trained as a, an engineer? Correct. Or, so okay. Bachelor's in engineering. Uh, start my early job, first job was in engineering, and then I moved to more techno-commercial kind of roles. So joining Guidant, I'm always interested in collecting stories or, or, or anecdotes or just general feelings about the company. It's always looked back at positively. Uh, anyone who is spent time there always uh, seems to have walked away with with a lot of lessons what was your what was your experience there i think they did a lot of things right you know the ability they invested in their people in in what i believe is pretty unprecedented they sent people like me with very little clinical experience into the field trained them helped you understand how the technology works how it impacts patients how to work in a hospital setting, understanding what the market needs are from a customer perspective. It's nice for somebody in marketing to imagine what the needs might be, but if you actually have first-hand experience supporting cases, I probably supported over a thousand implants of ICDs and pacemakers during my time in the field. So you get personal experience knowing what matters and what does not. You know, one thing I I say to my colleagues is 30 seconds 
in normal life versus 30 seconds in a surgery, right? They're two different, exact same units of time. The doctor's going to get pretty annoyed if you don't have an answer, you know, during a surgery and it takes you more than 30 seconds. So learning some of those things firsthand, I think, help set the stage for personal growth and professional growth thereafter. So I really like what Guyton did. I moved through marketing. And one of the other things that Guyton really did well was to allow you to work on new things. I was one of the early people to work on heart failure leads and delivery systems, which were, again, just entering the market, CRT and CRTD products. Uh, I was one of the early folks in upstream marketing working on them. Thereafter, I worked on the world's first wireless CRTD product and wireless home monitoring. So Guidant took a chance on you and allowed you to grow, maybe make a mistake or two along the way, but gave you a lot of responsibility and freedom, which is why it's not by accident that uh, there are so many leaders in medtech today that all got their start at Guidant or worked with Guidant at some point in their career. That's interesting. So looking at your, your background now, I see you were at Corventus in 2008, Vice President of Sales and Marketing, then President and CEO of, is it, is it Kima? Kima Medical? Kima, yeah. Kima Medical in 2014. What's interesting, look at your, your LinkedIn. So you were with Guidant, which was acquired by Boston, Preventus, which was acquired by Medtronic, Kima, which would be acquired by Zoll. You've had some experience with, with M&A, the first one being probably one of the more notable ones in the industry. Any sort of lessons from, I mean, it's the nature of the business being acquired, building a technology and being acquired by a bigger company. So it's not an unusual track record. But I wonder, having gone through that process a few times, I wonder if you have any sort of takeaways from good or bad lessons that, that have been learned, experiences that maybe stand out of something that can, went particularly well? What are your feelings about the, the M&A process? That's a great question. When we started at Corventus, initially it was started off as a heart failure company and we were building a heart failure product. And then soon after I joined, we realized that a heart failure product, one, we have to get FDA approval and make sure that the product delivers on its promise. But there was no reimbursement pathway back then for heart failure monitoring. And so we had, as a small company, we had to develop the technology, get the FDA comfortable with the technology, then also work on reimbursement and, and all of the other aspects. So it occurred to me that that and this was also in 2008, 2009, when the whole market was not doing very well. So it occurred to me that this would probably be a very heavy lift and it'll take a long time. So what I, one of the features in that product, and we were, I believe, the world's first patch-based arrhythmia monitor. So what I worked with the engineering team to say, hey, we are tracking ECGs can we make an ECG monitor out of this? And the engineering team delivered. We got FDA clearance for that product, the arrhythmia monitor. And then I set up the monitoring center in Philadelphia because Highmark was encouraging companies to help monitor patients with arrhythmias, especially if you can do it wirelessly and, and remotely. So we got Highmark to... Uh, reimburse the product. And even though we started off as a heart failure company, our first product that was commercial was actually an arrhythmia monitor. Hmm. And we were using it to monitor patients, not just in the US, but internationally with all of that data coming into our monitoring center in Philadelphia. That is just an example of how you might start somewhere but if you realize the lift is too heavy or, you know, it could be a regulatory challenge, it could be a technology challenge, you have to be nimble to make course adjustments so that you can continue to keep the faith of the investors and also have a timeline to profitability and things like that. And I, eventually... When Medtronic acquired that company, the first product that they launched was the Arrhythmia Monitor. And then, you know, heart failure came second because 
back then, even in 2014 and 15, there was no clear pathway to heart failure monitoring reimbursement. I love that anecdote. And I'm just curious, how clear is the path forward when you, you're at that moment where you think a pivot is necessary? Is a direct step onto a clear path when you do that? Or is it very much a leap of faith? I'm sure once you're done and you've sold the company, you're like, oh, that was clearly the right thing to do. But at the time, you're probably feeling your way through the dark a little bit, or, or do you not move forward until you're absolutely sure that that's the right direction to go? I think you have to have a leap of faith, right? You're yeah. not going to get every answer. And again, don't forget, this was 2009, right? The, all of the investments in you know venture capitalists were wary of investment. Now, of course, we were funded by Kleiner Perkins, and they believed in us, and, and they continued to fund us. But it was a challenge raising money. So we had to have a leap of faith. And back then, CardioNet had done some interesting work in reimbursement. So we had to project to our investors that we were doing something, yes, different, but less risky because we are following the reimbursement pathway laid out by CardioNet. We were going to fill up. So you had some data points that you could rely on, but it was a leap of faith, with, um, especially in those challenging times. Interesting. And then you got to be, go back to my M&A thread, but you got to be president and CEO of, of Common Medical Technologies. Was that something that you envisioned, that I want to be a, a startup CEO someday, or did the opportunity sort of present itself? I think, the, you know, I started off as being president. I was the first employee in, in the U.S. It was an Israeli company. Uh, oh, okay. And they had come up with a very innovative technology. The lead investor was from the Bay Area, so he reached out to me and we talked and, and I joined them because he liked my Corventus background and also my prior background in the heart failure space. And again, this is a, a wearable monitor. Uh, it's a patch-based monitor. And now I checked even this morning, it, it is available on the Zoll website as the Zoll heart failure system. So it is being marketed. So he thought that I could bring that kind of commercial lens to a technology developed from the Israeli uh, Defense Forces, right? So this technology came from Rafael Defense Systems, uh, the folks behind the Iron Dome and some of the other interesting technologies. So they used radar to monitor uh, body parameters. So in, in our case, we used the radar technology to monitor lung fluid. So by putting it on the side of your body, you could actually monitor lung fluid which again is a marker for patients with heart failure. So we developed that technology, made it useful in patients, and uh, Zoll really liked that. Have, you know, this was acquired by the LifeS division, having another wearable, in this case, a wearable defibrillator. They were wanting to get into the arrhythmia monitoring space and heart failure monitoring space. So they they acquired us. And I, I was just seeing this morning that uh, in the recent study at 90 days, this showed, I think, a 38% reduction in hospitalization, again, with an external monitor. And then I saw that as a first step. And then later on, if physicians believe that the patient would benefit, they can go in for a cardiomens or an endotronics or one of the other implantable products. But as a first line of attack, you could probably try the wearable heart failure monitor. Wow, so, that's great. Looking at the various M&A experiences you had, any, any sort of takeaways or, or common threads as to when it works well? It looks like they all had their own rationale behind it, which makes sense, but I don't know, there any commonalities or traits or takeaways from the experience? I think a couple of them, we had uh, near-death experiences at uh, both, both <laughs> startups. There were Fridays on which I was sitting uh, either with the management or with the board wondering how to make payroll on Monday. So wow. uh, both things happened in both companies. So a few lessons, you know, be ready for near-death experiences because we really had them with both companies. Hire experienced, versatile people because your initial business plan may not end up being the final business plan. If you bring people with experience and versatility, you can pivot from product A to product B. Whether it's technologists, reimbursement experts, regulatory experts, all of them, the more experience they have, I think the better. Be conserve cash 
to the extent you can. I mean, people may promise you, but when it comes time to give you, write you a check, it may or may not always happen. So conserve cash and always ask yourself, is, is the business model still relevant? And B, I think lastly, be ready to go downstream. You know, at Corventus, we, we went downstream. So we actually had paying customers at site. We had a few reps and we had paying customers in the U.S. We also had a B2B business. Uh, we were selling the arrhythmia monitors to a large uh, pharma companies that were using it in their clinical trials. So be ready to bring in revenue in any way possible. If you had asked me in 2008, would I be working with a pharma company to bring in revenue for arrhythmia monitoring? I would have said no way, but that's (laughs) That's great. And I want to get into Acura. We're here to talk about Acura Medical, but I don't want to leave out the fact you were Divisional Vice President of Global Heart Failure Marketing at Abbott. Uh, How did that come about, that position, and any quick takeaways for that little, little startup called Abbott? No, I mean, Abbott was great. Abbott was a great experience. They approached me in 2017 to be part of the heart failure team here in Pleasanton. A few folks have told me the best experience you can get, and some recruiters have said the best talent that they like are people that have worked for one guidant and two Abbott. So if you work with both, you're top talent. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave. look at you. <laughs> I'll leave that there. But I think Abbott was at a very interesting time. They had bought St. Jude Medical, which in turn had bought Thoratech. So I was part of the heart failure division. We had uh, three main products, the HeartMate 3 LVAD. We had CardioMems. And then we had the Centromac family of products for uh, ECMO. And I thought that it was really great. When I joined Abbott, there were uh, two players in the LVAD market, neck to neck. Abbott had also was working on the largest uh, LVAD study, the Momentum 3 study. So uh, getting that to its logical closure, working with uh, the marketing team, building up a marketing team, growing the market, working on also growing share for Abbott. I think it offered a lot of uh, interesting opportunities and I really loved my time there. Cardiomems was another high growth potential product working on the guide heart failure study, seeing its publication in 2022 and seeing how the patient population expanded from, uh, with the FDA approval in 2022, expanded from about 300,000 to 1.5 million. So I love various aspects of working for Abbott in terms of, you know, helping grow the market, helping grow share, uh, being very disciplined about uh, you know, uh, financials at the company. I've seen few companies being as disciplined about the business aspects of things as Abbott. So that again was a learning experience, which uh, helps me here. And I hope I contributed there. I mean, when I joined, when I was the head of global marketing, sales were in the 500 million. When I left, they were about 900 million plus. So I hope uh, my team and I had a role in that. We also got some chairman's awards for best launch of the HeartMate 3 Momentum 3 study and things like that. So excellent experience to contribute and excellent learning from such an established player like Avid. That's great. So what was it about uh, Acura Medical that convinced you to leave that? Did, did you have uh, your mind on being a startup CEO again? And, and what was it about Acura's potential that lured you away? Yeah, one had heard about Chief Ahmed over the years and, and the success that they had. Uh, I had not met uh, the founder of Chief Ahmed, Amr Salahie, but I had heard of him. I had seen him in conferences and things like that. So this was a very interesting opportunity uh, to build a company and to lead it from the early stages. They had just finished the Series A funding in January 22, you know, and I was speaking with the leadership team here at Chief Ahmed about this opportunity around that time. And it, again, got me very interested. My own father had uh, deep vein thrombosis. Uh, Luckily, that one that resolved fairly quickly, about 2011 or so. And I have seen the devastation of pulmonary embolism among friends, family, and and others. Uh, As you know, it affects about 900,000 people in the U.S. is the 
third leading cause of death other than heart attack and stroke. So it is a serious issue and uh, an opportunity to build a company from the ground up in the Bay Area and not just build one aspect, meaning the technology, but also building out the clinical, the regulatory, the manufacturing, all of that. And again, Tom, you saw it back in October. We have a vertically integrated line here. That was just an opportunity that promised to be a lot of fun and also an opportunity to do something in the space. I know there are other players in the space, but I think the penetration in this marketplace is still in the low teens or mid teens. There is a huge opportunity in the U.S. and internationally, even today, the penetration of these devices is very, very low. So technology can drive adoption. Again, going back to my multi-link stent example, that paved the way for a lot of stents you know, thereafter. And I feel that Technology can make a huge difference, and that is what we're trying to do here at Okura. So this seemed like a great opportunity, and uh, I jumped on it. Talk a bit about the technology and how it sort of checked those boxes. I'm always fascinated by by companies that are smaller companies that are developing new technology that obviously will differentiate itself from maybe existing products out there. But the fact that they're moving into a space where there already are some players, but they think they can do a better job, I think they can grab market share. Talk a bit about Acura's approach. Why is it different? And why do you think it's going to sort of check off that box that you're going to be able to increase adoption or encourage adoption by bringing this someday to market? Yeah, I think the existing players have done a wonderful job educating the market. They have been growing, give or take 25, 30% every year, including 23 And I think they've done a great job in helping launch the field of mechanical thrombectomy and getting it to where it is. And uh, there are, as with anything else, there are continued opportunities for improvement. And uh, one is, how do you remove all types of clot in the venous system? So that is one, without having multiple catheter exchanges, how do you get the catheters delivered to the location of the clot and optimize that? And then how do you provide guidance to the physician through the procedure? So these were, uh, we conducted some extensive market research in 2021 and 22. We spoke with physicians, practitioners using existing technologies and said, what are the technological gaps? And then we internally figured out how we could address them. So in terms of removing all types of clots, one of the things we have incorporated into our technology, we have aspiration, mechanical aspiration, and we also have fragmentation technology to break up the clot. So what that allows us to do is to go with a lower profile system to capture the clot, break it up, and then send it outside the body. So we have developed a single pass system. There is no need for multiple catheter exchanges. You go in, get close to the clot, aspirate it, fragment it, remove it, and be done. So this allows us to very effectively and hopefully quickly remove clot. Second thing is by having a flexible system. We have a steerable sheath. We have the ability to shoot contrast to help guide uh, catheter delivery inside the body and make it get close to the clot. What it does is our sheath is a 16 French system with a 12 French catheter. So it's a lower profile system. We are able to access the clot quickly and optimize delivery of the system to the location of the clot as determined by the CT scan and as determined by injecting small amounts of contrast. The third thing is throughout the procedure, we have a console where you get measurements in terms of blood drawn, in terms of confirmation of clot engagement, and also pulmonary artery pressure readings. As you get to the pulmonary artery and once you're there, you get pressure readings from a pressure sensor that is integrated with our 16 French sheath. So with that, you are getting constant feedback on the pressures from the system 
And we believe that that would be useful in determining whether the clot has been captured and what the pressure changes once the clot has been removed. So again, more work has to be done. Our first job has to has been to provide the technology. Secondly, we now need to work on the regulatory pathway and then validate it clinically. But based on the first five patients that we have done in the Republic of Georgia last year, these are all useful tools. And the system is behaving in in the manner that we designed it uh, to provide a material benefit. But again, that will have to be validated from a regulatory and clinical perspective. So I'm sorry if you're repeating yourself, but the current surgeons or physicians currently using this, what system or method do they use to sort of measure the success that they're they're having? It sounds as if yours has a more utilizes sensor technology to kind of give them a better sense of of how things are going and and clearing the clot. And how is that compared to what's currently available? Right. So in our system, everything is integrated, so you don't need to use external products. You okay. know? So some physicians will use a pigtail pressure sensor, so they will use a normal pressure sensor to get an idea of the pressure. Some, based on their experience, will know which clots to target. And once they remove the clot, they're able to determine based on the volume of clot. But as you can imagine, the volume of clot is not identical in different patients. So you you might remove 20 ml of clot from patient A and and they'll be fine and you might need to remove more in the next patient. And the clot morphology is also uh, not the same, right? The consistency in morphology is different. So they do use judgment. They do use other pressure sensors today. And obviously these are being done successfully today. We believe that we can enhance this whole process by integrating it within our system. So you don't have to use other products and you have the information available to you throughout the procedure. What are the challenges that these surgeons are currently having that your, your system will help with? I imagine it's going to be simpler if they're, they're not inserting multiple devices. Maybe there's fewer support staff in the room with them because they don't have as many things to monitor. Maybe it's just a faster procedure because it's kind of a single in and out. Maybe it's a combination of all the three. What are are the problems that you're solving or hope to be solving with this technology? Right. I think first thing is it's an integrated system. So fewer exchanges. You go in, it's a single pass system. It's a sheath custom, sheath catheter combination. You go in with the same product and, and you finish the case and you exit. So uh, fewer exchanges, fewer instances of lollipopping, which is when a clot is sticking, a, a large piece of clot is sticking to the distal end of the catheter, and then you have to remove the whole system and then go back in. So we, we don't have to do that. We can inject small amounts of contrast to determine the position of the catheter relative to the clot and precisely capture the clot hopefully reducing blood loss in the process because if you are not on top of the clot and you aspirate, you're going to pull blood out. But if you are on top of the clot, you will only pull out the clot. I think those are some of the things. We are a lower profile system, so it's a 16 French sheet with a 12 French catheter. In other words, that helps with navigating inside the body and accessing some of the more distal branches And having information about blood loss and pressure readings and all of that, I hope will simplify decision making. So overall, again, to be validated, but overall we believe is that the case should be a little simpler, go faster. The extra information should make it also be usable by physicians at expert skill levels or less than expert skill levels, right? Because you can't always guarantee that every hospital will have the best staff and the most experienced physician at any given time. These are sometimes urgent cases. So this, I hope, will broaden the appeal of this whole field and allow greater access to this technology in the U.S., but also make it easier to be used internationally. And just as a proof point, when we did the first case, five cases in Georgia, in the Republic of Georgia, these were physicians that had never done mechanical thrombectomy before. Hmm. We were able to train them, get them to understand the process, 
and successfully treat patients with results very similar to the results seen in the U.S. studies. So our results were pretty compelling given the fact that these were physicians that had never done mechanical thrombectomy earlier. And I would guess that having one system that kind of collects all this information and, and data could also be upgraded at some point to put all that data to use in terms of measuring success of procedures and things like that. Do you look is that incorporated in, in what you'd like to make commercial initially, or is that something you kind of look forward down the road? Like eventually we want this to be synced up with a digital surgery tool or even a robot or something like that. Do you kind of think that far ahead? I think, you know, it, it offers possibilities in terms of potentially, you know, can you provide some guidance to physicians, yep. etc. The console, the way we have designed it today, has, it's a full-fledged computer also. It has the pumps and the motors and all of this, that equipment, but it also yep. has a full-fledged computer that can be designed to communicate with the cloud. It can be designed to do other things okay. uh, beyond just supporting the procedure. So it may not be, all of this may not be available on day one, but you can think of all the innovation that could be possible once you have a system like this that has a full-fledged onboard computer that has communication and other capabilities. A couple of questions just sort of as to the company itself. So you're in the mode where you're developing and perfecting the technology. You talked about regulatory and we can maybe hit upon that next, but what are what are sort of the other silos within a cure that you're building at the same time you're trying to prove the device can can do what you think it does? Are you just focusing on regulatory? Do you have an eye are you also starting to put a pot on for commercial like or in building this startup? Is it sequential or, or are you doing a lot of things simultaneous? How does that take shape? We're doing a few things simultaneously, right? We uh, currently we are building our manufacturing capabilities, so we we are now fully vertically integrated. As of you know, by the end of this quarter, we'll be making pretty much the whole product internally. Uh, okay. You know, so that means the console and the disposable catheter sheets, etc. We are building completely in house. So that was one. Number two is looking at the venous thromboembolism indication for the U.S. market to start with and then looking at expanding those indications thereafter with the help of IDE and non-IDE studies. So that is something we are working on, expanding our clinical footprint. That is number two. And then also looking at expanding the regulatory footprint. So once we... We do all three, hopefully later in 24 and in 25. Then the question comes about commercialization and how best to achieve it, right? And and whether we we start with a few centers of excellence for our product and, and then take it from there, or I think probably we'll end up doing something like that. We start with a limited number of centers and then expand accordingly, as we will also have to expand based on uh, the new indications that we will be getting. So in order to do a, get a pulmonary embolism indication in the U.S. market, one is expected to do from based on what we can see from the others, about 100, 120 patient uh, single arm study and to prove that the product does what the company believes it, it can do and treat pulmonary embolism patients successfully. So that is something that uh, we'll be working on simultaneously. So it's not fully serial. Uh, A lot of things will happen simultaneously. And again, just to give you an example, a lot of parts we use right now are 3D printed parts. We will be transitioning to injection molded parts and next versions of the technology from an R&D perspective too. That's exciting. Final question. Just uh, I know folks hear the name Shifa Med, and you referenced it a bit earlier. But can you just sort of give me a sense, or give our listeners a sense as to how Cura Medical sort of fits into the broader Shifa Med landscape? You're all kind of on the same family compound there, but I know you have relationships with the other portfolio companies. You certainly share walls in some cases, or parking lots at least. But where does Cura fit into Shifa Med more broadly, and how, do, how does this ecosystem sort of work to to create new startups? Great question. I, you know, I, I saw the birth of Laza, our most recent startup in the end of 2023, where they raised their Series A round. And I think it's a wonderful ecosystem and I love the collaboration among the companies. Also, 
the model whereby the shared resources take care of uh, some of the critical functions like HR, intellectual property, finance, some of those things are shared resources. And each company literally focuses on what it needs to do. So R&D, clinical, regulatory operations, those areas. And I don't need to worry about following all of the HR laws because the shared resource team takes care of HR or finance and other laws. Just to give you an example, I won't mention the company, but one startup that I worked in earlier during due diligence, we found out that we had forgotten to file our tax return. (laughs) (laughs) Oopsie. Uh, I mean, it's not a big deal. We had no revenues at that stage, so we filed it. But... That will not happen here. Again. Yeah, that will not happen here. Yeah. And just to give you a, a real concrete example, right? None of my team members had ever been to the Republic of Georgia, but our sister company had gone there. They had done some studies. They had worked with a CRO in the Republic of Georgia. So we leverage our sister company's efforts in terms of insurance, CRO, all of those things. And we were able to get a running start. Uh, otherwise, I don't even know where I would have started if I decided, okay, I want to go to the Republic of Georgia. Where do I even start? start? Whereas our sister company had done that work, so we were able to leverage that. So I can give you tons of such examples of how this ecosystem helps each other. I love the model. It is a great model. As I said, we enjoyed our our visit there. And I'm sure as you all find your successes, that that institutional knowledge is going to get bigger and bigger and produce even better results. Well, this has been a a great visit. I think a lot of of lessons learned. And Mirali, thank you for, for joining us on the podcast. Absolutely. Delighted to be here and delighted to continue to work with you, Tom. Again, we are about 40 strong now at Akura and we are continuing to grow. And I encourage uh, your listeners to keep track of us on our website and on our LinkedIn channel and continue to track our progress. Glad you brought that up. I spoke with an engineer yesterday who was asking about where to find opportunities. I said, go check out ShifaMed. Like they've got a lot going on over there. So glad you fit that plug in. All right. Well, thanks, Marley. Great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tom. All right, well, that is a wrap. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. Please do a few things. Please subscribe to the Device Talks Podcast Network so you don't miss a future episode of our great, 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 great podcasts. Please share this episode of Device Talks Weekly on social media. And when you do, connect with me, Tom Salemi, at Device Talks. Also, connect with uh, Chris Newmarker. He is editor-in-chief of Mass Device. You can find us both on LinkedIn. And you know what? Even if you're not sharing this episode, well, shame on you, but connect with us anyway. We'd love to be a part of your MedTech conversations going forward. Please give give the Device Talks Podcast Network a ranking on iTunes uh, or whatever podcast player you're using. I'm told those rankings are a great way to build our audience and we would love to have the help. Thank you to everyone who's listening, but we want to get the word out uh, to even more people. So uh, give us a ranking. Finally, don't forget to uh, register for next week's Surgical Robotics Week. It's part of Device Talks Tuesdays. You can do that at devicetalks.com. And of course, register for Device Talks Boston, which is happening on May 1st and 2nd at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. So uh, please uh, don't wait. There's a special offer coming. I'll have more more details uh, coming to you shortly uh, about a uh, special networking uh, workshop that uh, you will want to uh, potentially be a part of. So go to devicetalks.com to register. That's it. Thanks again for listening in. Tune in next week. We'll have another episode of the Device Talks weekly podcast coming your way. 